welcome to the John Baldwin Show here on Victory Radio. And I am very excited once again to have Pastor Carl Gallops on the show. Pastor Carl Gallops has been the senior pastor of Hickory Hammock Baptist Church in Milton, Florida since 1987. He is a critically acclaimed Amazon Top 60 best-selling author of numerous books, uh, including one we're going to be talking about here in just a few minutes. He is a former decorated Florida law enforcement officer, having served with two different sheriff's offices under three different sheriff's administration. He is a graduate of Florida State University, the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, and the Florida Law Enforcement Officer Training Academy. Boy, that's a tongue twister. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Carl serves as the Board of Regents with the University of Mobile in Mobile, Alabama. He's been a frequent guest on national and international television and radio programs such as Coast to Coast AM and Skywatch TV. Um, so I'm just uh, uh, very happy to have you on the show. Welcome. Well, thank you so much, John. It's, a, it's an honor. It's my honor to be here. Well, I got to tell you, this last book you've written, uh, God of the Final Kingdoms, well, um, it has just blown me away. And, you know, I, I do a lot of Bible studying and reading, and I love reading about science and the Bible. And you had so many things in there that I had never even contemplated or thought about before. It was so educational to me. Just give us a, a, a quick overview of the book and, and the purpose for writing it. Well, listen, I really, really appreciate your kind words, and I'm, I'm really honored that you've read the book. Uh, and, and, yeah, and people who've read it from beginning to end seem to be impacted the same way, and I praise the Lord for that. I praise Him for giving me this insight. But the bottom line is, yeah, the overview, the quick overview, that is, I don't know, about 350 pages of reading material, and, but each chapter, as you know, is only five pages long, so it's an easy read. I deal with deep topics and deep mysteries of God's Word, uh, but I, I try to write at a level that everybody who can read and wants to read can understand. It's not written for at a doctoral level. Uh, it's written for people in the pew. It's written for the church. It's written for pastors, teachers, and Christians, and even people who are seeking truth from God's Word to pick it up. You know, take a little time to be able to read it. So, uh, but but the theme of it is gods of the final kingdom. It's it's the third in a series of books that I've written with a title similar to that. The first one was called Gods and Thrones. The second one was called Gods of the Final. Uh, excuse me, Gods of Ground Zero. And then this third one, Gods of the Final Kingdom. But I want your audience to know that it's you don't have to read them in order. Each one stands alone. However, if you will read all three of them, I think you'll have this deep deep understanding of the connection of the Word of God from Genesis to Revelation, um, exploring and understanding deep and difficult mysteries of God's Word and how they tie not only to, you know, to the Word of God itself from Genesis to Revelation in a contextual manner, but also to our own personal lives, and, and just as important, uh, to the day in which we're living, the prophetic times in which we're living. I'm telling you, it'll make the headlines... Uh, seem a whole lot different to you after you've read this book, and it will give you tremendous power in your own life. It's because you you really do begin to see. I'm making air quotes right now. You know, eyes to see, ears to hear. It really does give you that. So anyway, but but the thing is, um, the, the term God. I want your audience to know is don't don't be freaked out by that. It comes from the Hebrew word Elohim. It can be used singular or plural. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That really says in Hebrew, in the beginning, Elohim. Well, we know that's singular, and it means God himself, the Lord God, because it goes on to say, and he said, and he said, and he said. So, but then the, that same term is used for God, little g, uh, where uh, throughout the Old Testament especially, where God speaks to the angelic realm, and particularly the fallen angelic realm, and calls them uh, Elohim. He gives them his name, kind of like a family name. And so when it's in the plural, it always speaks of the divine realm, the angelic realm. And and uh, in fact, in Deuteronomy, it talks about them worshiping other gods. And then he says that these are no gods at all. They are demons. So there's an example of the use of Elohim in the plural. In fact, the first commandment, thou shalt have no other Elohim before you. Thou shalt have no other gods before you. So that's where the title comes from. So when you get to gods of the final kingdom, now you understand kind of what it's about. In other words, there is a final kingdom coming. Satan 
now these spirits of perversion and and um, twisting of the word and twisting of truth and throwing truth to the ground and great delusions uh, no longer just sweep certain cultures. Now it's sweeping the planet because of our instantaneous communication abilities through internet, and, and, you know, etc., social media, uh, you know, satellite news channels, cable channels, all of that worldwide. These spirits of deception, uh, the spirit of deception just really, really permeates the planet. So in that, the Bible told us thousands of years ago that Satan will use these kinds of technologies. Oh, it doesn't speak of the names of those technologies, but the Bible does say the whole world will see it at once. The whole world will take a mark. The whole world will worship him. A signs and wonders from the, from the heavens. Uh, you know, a human being will speak and something will come out of the heavens. Fire will come out of the heavens. Well, that could be supernatural, John. Yeah. I mean, just purely supernatural. But on the other hand, John, who was writing the book of Revelation, saw something 2,000 years into his future, at least 2,000 years. Well, the thing is, we now know that human beings, at the push of a button, can bring fire out of heaven. I mean, we, we've got, you know, drones and, and, and now satellite laser technology they're working on, and, and you know, it, and so you can literally use a satellite technology and drone technology, couple them together, and a guy sitting in Nevada in an underground bunker can take out a singular person in Afghanistan walking down the street. Fire from heaven is being called down. So there's an example of how that scripture that was written thousands of years ago is literally and physically taking place right now. So whether or not that's what it meant, or if it's something even more devastating than that, and maybe even something totally just supernatural and demonic, we will soon see. But the bottom line is, the Bible speaks of the things that we're now living in, John. And so... What I'm trying to do is to tie all of this together from Genesis to Revelation, from the Garden of Eden to the last chapter of Revelation, showing God's people in today's church that's being dumbed down like the rest of our culture, like our public schools and everything else, everything's being dumbed down, history, uh, you know, social understanding, uh, the understanding of sexuality and marriage and home and family and gender and, and, and on and on. Everything's being dumbed down, including the church. And what I'm trying to do is to restore the contextual, even the classical understanding of the truths of God's Word that brings it alive. And so, of course, the final kingdom belongs to God Himself, Jesus Christ, of course. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The Bible tells us Jesus will put His foot on the Mount of Olives, and from there He will rule and reign the nations. And so we know this is coming, but Satan thinks He will take this world. He thinks it's rightly his, and and I explain all of that, I show that in the scriptures in this book. You've read it, so you understand mm -hmm. this. Yes. You also understand, and I want your, your listeners to understand that, listen, this stuff that I write in these books, I don't just pull this out of my back pocket, and it's not just my opinion and, you know, fanciful interpretations. Um, I back up every claim I make with plenty of, of scholarly attestation uh, classical scholars from hundreds of years ago, even thousands of years ago that saw this stuff, um, modern-day scholars, word studies, language studies, Greek and Hebrew, um, uh, even if it calls for scientific knowledge, I go into the scientific angle. If it calls for archaeological or historical understanding, I go into that. Again, written at a snappy pace and a pace that anybody sitting in the pew that likes to read about God's Word can understand. So, so I just, it's a book that explains it, some of it will unnerve people because they'll say, oh my gosh, I did not know that. But it ends, I think, very powerfully with an encouraging, encouraging understanding of who we are, where it's all headed, and how much God loves us. And so, believe it or not, that's my quick assessment. <laughs> yes, that's all right. Well, and, and I think in our Western culture, particularly here in America, for some reason, the churches don't teach this anymore, and I'm I'm really disappointed in that because people are not being equipped to understand, you know, how the spiritual world connects with with the material world. I mean, you mentioned I think you used the word cosmic. I mean, there's a cosmic narrative all through the Bible, but we just yes. don't see it a lot of times. Yes, no, you're absolutely right, and, and John, thank you for bringing that up because you know I've got several chapters in there where I show and prove that the Bible speaks of multiple dimensions, 
mm-hmm. and portals to those dimensions. It speaks of time travel. I mean, it literally does. I'm not trying to be cool about this or, or sensational. It literally speaks of these things and insists that we just believe them by faith because, of course, when, this, when these words were written thousands of years ago, beginning in Moses' day and right on through, up through John the Revelator's day, None of these scientific facts were discovered. I say scientific facts because with the whole field of quantum mechanics and quantum science, quantum physics, we we now understand there literally are multiple dimensions. That's what the whole CERN had had done collider is about. In fact, fact, China's building one right now. It's going to be bigger than the one in Switzerland. And and so, you know, and, and they are looking for the portals to get in and out of these multiple dimensions. They say that on their website. I mean, this is the science world. Uh, And so I've got all of that quoted and referenced in my book. Um, And so when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me, what did he just say? Well, he spoke of multiple dimensions, and he spoke of a portal. Hmm. Uh, All right, so if we're in the earth, on the earthly realm, the physical realm, well, where is this Father of whom he speaks? Where is God? How do we get to his presence? Well, flesh and blood does not inherit the kingdom. Oh, so there's another visible place, but our earthly flesh and blood cannot go there. Exactly, exactly. Just like a fish is physical and lives at the bottom of the ocean, but he cannot come to New York City and walk around the street. Uh, you know, and there's another physical dimension, two physical realities that exist side by side, but one cannot come into the other. Interestingly, we humans can go into the fish's world, but the fish cannot come into our world. So when Jesus says, you can come into the world of my Father, but only by me. I'm the way. I'm the door. I'm the gate. Jesus uses all of those terms to speak of himself. He's speaking of himself, if you will, as a portal. A relationship with him. Only he has the power to transform us and fit us for his kingdom, the, the other physical dimension that exists. It's what Jesus told the thief on the cross. He said, today, you... You, the essence of who you are, will be being, uh, you know, in reality, in the flesh, with me. I mean, a physical presence with relationship. He says, today, you will be with me in paradise. And uh, so, so it, the Bible is filled with this kind of speech. Um, you know, Jesus talks about the rich man and Lazarus and the chasm in mm-hmm. between them and the rich man and, heaven, and, and hell and, the, and Lazarus and paradise. I mean, there's multiple dimensions and portals and and, 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 so, and time travel. I mean, the rich man saying, please go, go to, and tell my brothers. And, and, you know, no, I, you know, no, they have the word. They, you know, even if somebody came back from the dead, they wouldn't believe, of course, prophesying about the resurrection of Jesus. It's all right there in the word. We seldom speak of it. And when those scriptures are preached, we seldom hear these great physical, biblical, truths that help us to understand that when we speak of spiritual things, we're not speaking of wispy, ghosty, you know, make-believe, uh, hyper-sensational, oh, you believe in all that life after death stuff. No, we're speaking physical truth, physical reality that even quantum physics is beginning to understand and write in scientific journals that, oh my gosh, there are physical realms, there are physical dimensions. In fact, now, a whole field of, of thought in, in quantum mechanics based upon all that we've discovered, and this is, again, quoted in reference to my book, is that there may be multiple universes. It's called the multiverse theory, yeah. and when you start studying the scientific papers on that, they say that this is one of the most likely of all of the phys- of physics theories that exist because there's more evidence to prove that there are multiple universes than any other thing they talk about in physics. So, multiple universes, wow! Multiple dimensions that are physical and real, wow! Do you know that the Bible speaks of multiple universes? Of course it does. It's all right there in the Word, and it's all right there in my book, Exposed. So, anyway, this is what I'm trying to wake people up to see. You're absolutely right. You hear very little of it in modern churches, and I'm I'm not judging anybody. Because there was a time early in my ministry, I didn't know any of this stuff either. So I didn't preach it. Didn't make me evil. Didn't make me a heretic. It just meant that once I did discover this stuff, once I started researching it, once I started going to the classical scholars and seeing that they saw it, they wrote about it. But somewhere along the line, it just didn't fit in American churches. Because Americans want the glitz and the glamour. They want the shiny things and the, the, the fluffy things that feel 
feel good. Just preacher, just tell me how to feel better about myself. Give mm-hmm. me three ways to make myself feel better with a poem and uh, you know a, just a little, little funny illustration or a joke, and let us go home, and then we can say we've been to church. But guys, uh, for your listeners, that's not what life is about. That's not what this world is about. Yeah. And my book unfolds it, exposes it, and and shows you all of these truths. And I tell you, when you walk away from it, um, uh, I, I really believe you'll have a much better understanding of God's Word and, and who you are in Jesus Christ, John. Well, here's an interesting question. When you were talking about that, it made me think of some different examples in the Bible. What, when the, um, the angels appeared to the shepherds the night Jesus was born, was that a, a portal or a door opening? Uh, absolutely. And, and, and listen, uh, because, because see, th- we are the fish. They are the humans in New York City. In, mm-hmm. other words, in other words, they can come into our realm, but we cannot go into their realm until we are transformed, until we are given glorified bodies. So, as you know, I use the illustration in my book. I've got four or five chapters. Again, they're only five pages each. So, where I where I use this illustration of the of the fish tank analogy, this huge fish tank in the home of a billionaire. The, the fish tank takes up all four walls of this huge room. I mean, it's a multi-million dollar fish tank, and the fish inside of it. That's all they know. That's their universe. It's huge. It's their world. They can see through the glass dimly. You notice I just quoted a passage. It's very, very thick because it's so huge. The water pressure is so great. The the glass is thick. So from time to time, they see shadowy figures of something on the outside, but they don't know us. They don't know what's out there. They just know something's out there. As most humans, 7 billion people on the planet, almost all of them will say, yeah, I believe there's something on the other side. Why? Well, we experience it. We feel things. We see things. We we understand things. Well, the fish is the same way in the fish tank. They, They understand something's there, but they don't have a clue. They don't know that 7 billion others of us are out there. They don't even know about us. They don't know about children and male and female and, and families and homes and marriages. They don't know about our brain and that we've invented things to go to the moon in, that we sent satellites into space, that we invented computers and internets and cell phones and automobiles and cities and skyscrapers and submarines and spaceships and airplanes. They don't know any of that. They just know the shadowy figures they can see while they're in that tank, in that room. But let's say that somehow a fish was able to be transformed into a human and dropped into our world, out of the fish tank. Then they would see what's really been wrapped around them all along. Then they would understand. Then they would be overwhelmed at the grandness, the hugeness of it all, the complexity and the wonder and the beauty of what really lied outside of their physical reality all along. And John, that's the message of God's word from Genesis to Revelation. Yeah. We are in the fish tank, but there's a new kingdom coming. We will understand, we will see it as it is. The Bible, the New Testament says we will be like the angels. And it even says you, we will be like Jesus. We will be like him on that day. Like, it doesn't mean we're going to be Jesus. It doesn't mean we're going to turn into an angel. But it means our divine nature will be restored. We will be like Adam and Eve in the garden before the fall. They walked with God. They conversed with the angels. They, I mean, it was all heaven and earth were joined together at Eden until the fall. And the Bible says all that will be restored one day. That brings a whole new perspective on our life now. Um, these little 70, 80, 90 years that we might have if we're blessed, uh, they go by so quickly. But if we belong to the Lord, if we're under the blood of Jesus, uh, if we've been set apart by the Holy Spirit of God through a born-again experience, um, then we will partake of the kingdom that is to come. We will be the fish that will be turned into humans and, and taken outside of the fish tank and brought into the kingdom of, of another physical reality. Again, Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. I'm taking you outside of the fish tank. I'm going to hold you by the hand, and I'm going to bring you into my father's mansion. In my father's house are many mansions. Does all that make sense, John? Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. It, gives a, it gives a different perspective to life, doesn't it, once we understand these things. And once we see that it's right there in the Bible, it starts in the book of Genesis, mm-hmm. the talking of different dimensions and portals. It goes all the way through to the book of Revelation. It's right before our eyes, but seldom do we hear it preached. Yeah. When Jesus was here on earth, 
How much does Satan know about Jesus and what his mission was? You talk about that at length in the book. Kind of give us a synopsis of that. Yeah, I do. I do that in the beginning of the book, especially because I'm setting up the whole understanding of Satan thinks it's his. Satan is supernatural. And what that word means, again, it doesn't mean wispy and ghostly. He is physical. But he operates in in, a, in another dimension. He's outside the fishbowl. That's why he's called the prince of the power of the air, or the god, the little g, of this world, the prince and ruler of this world. Um, but and, and the demonic realm that he is in control of. So what I try to unfold in the, in the early chapters of the book is to say, look, He's supernatural. He knows so much more than we do. He's like a deer hunter. In other words, I hunt deer. I've killed a lot of deer. But into a deer, I mean, at the moment, they maybe look up and see me in the tree and the gun goes off. They think, what kind of God is that? You know, this supernatural thing. You know, a deer can't climb a tree. They don't understand, you know, and hold a fire stick that, <laughs> that, mm-hmm. that brings them down. So, so I'm supernatural to the deer. Well, but I'm not God. I mean, the reason I'm supernatural to them is my brain is a whole lot sharper than theirs overall. And I, and I have been hunting them for, you know, 40, 50 years of my life. I've studied them. I read about them. I get in the woods. I, I know their habits. I know how to set up on their trail. I know what bait they respond to. Well, think about that. That's what Satan does with us. He's been around for thousands and thousands of years. A hunter of flesh, a hunter of humanity. He knows what tempts us. He knows what lures us. He knows what bait to use. He knows the trails we take, the paths we take. I don't know that he can read our minds, but he doesn't have to. I can't right. read a deer's mind, but I don't have to in order to be able to take a deer out of the woods. So, so I try to show that he is, he's so much more than we are, but he's not God. But he wants to be. He wants to be the ruler of it all. Isaiah 14, he says that. I will ascend to the throne of the Most High. I will be the God above all gods. And so so I, I, I try to show the readers that, look, okay, when you put the whole story together, I don't really have time to tell it. My, my book tells the whole story, but I'm just going to give the synopsis and hopefully whet the appetite for your listeners. That the Bible says that Jesus was the last slain before the foundation of the earth. That means before Adam drew his first breath. They, God's throne already had the whole salvation plan planned out. They, see, God knew. God knew what was going to happen and how he was going to remedy it. But the Bible tells us something powerful in the book, in, in Peter, 1 Peter and 2 Peter, and I'm going to cram those, those in chapter 1 of each. I'm going to cram them together and just paraphrase. But you know what Peter said there? He said, look, now we have the word of God made more certain. Now we have the prophecies made more certain. And he said, you know, prophecy was never given by the, by, by the will of man, but it was given by the Holy Spirit of God. And it's not open to the private interpretation of the prophet himself. Even the prophets didn't know. They, find, they knew they were writing about something for another generation yet to come. And then, the, then, then Peter says, even the angels long to look into these things. In other words, when God's plan of salvation was formulated at the throne, Satan didn't know what it was. Even the angelic realm didn't know all the working details of it. Even the prophets to whom it was started to be given, they prophesied of it to show that God is on his throne and the Bible is the word of God and all of this is real. But the prophets weren't allowed to know every detail of timing and charts and graphs and maps and exactly how it would happen. They just gave the bits and pieces and and pieces parts that God gave them for the puzzle to come together. So when it happened then humanity would do like Peter and say, oh my gosh, there it is. Now we have the word of the prophets made more certain. Let me just translate that into modern English. Now we know the word of God is true. <laughs> and now we know there is a God in heaven. Now we know when the prophets spoke, and then it comes true in our lifetime, now we can be overwhelmed with the fact that God is in control. And even the angels don't know every detail of this. Even the prophets that spoke it, they didn't know every detail but yet it happened, and we are witnesses of it. So, when you begin to understand that, watch this. We go back to Genesis 3.15. That's the Garden of Eden account. Satan, Adam, and Eve have polluted and perversed the garden. They have profaned it. Now, God steps in. He hands out the, 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 the judgments upon them. And when he gets to Satan, He says, let me tell you something. From the womb of a woman will come forth a child, a seed. And we know it's a male child because God says, he will crush your head. Oh, you will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. In other words, he's going to destroy you, Satan. He's going to kill you. You're going to die because of this. But before that, 
your kingdom will be brought down to the dust. And so, Satan knows what's going to happen to him and why it's going to happen. But he doesn't really, and he knows a little bit about how it's going to it's a child coming from the womb of a human woman. I mean, that had to be insulting to Satan. But he doesn't know when, he doesn't know who, he doesn't know where, and he doesn't know all the details of the how. So as you continue reading through, you discover the whole rest of the Bible, really, up until the coming of the Christ, is this saga of Satan trying to find out about it. Yeah. I mean, he tries to destroy all the male children in Egypt, he tries to destroy all the Jews under Persia, under Haman, he tries to destroy all the male children in Bethlehem once he zeroes in on that. Well, what's it about? Because he's looking for that seed. Then shows up, then Jesus shows up in a public ministry, and he winds up going right into Satan's domain, into the wilderness, and he waits 40 days. And then Satan shows up. And then Satan is saying, if you are the Son of God, if you are the Son of God, do this, do this. Jump off the pinnacle, turn these stones into bread, if you are the Son of God. And Jesus just speaks to him from the Word. He basically says, shut up, Satan, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Yes, definitely. Yeah, so the whole thing is is that there's a whole lot Satan didn't know. There's still a whole lot he doesn't know now. And people say, and I address this in the book, well, why couldn't Satan have just read the Bible? Well, first of all, most of what we call the Bible wasn't even available in the New Testament. Time. Satan didn't, you know, he didn't have access to the New Testament. It wasn't written yet. So, <laughs> but even the Old Testament, the prophecies that are they're basically in coded format. Yeah. Satan doesn't have the Holy Spirit. He doesn't have the divine ability to 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 interpret prophecy and scripture. He just is a hunter. He's sitting in the deer stand. He has studied us. He knows a lot. Therefore, he's like a god, little g, to us. But he's not god, big g, to us. And so there's a lot he doesn't know. We give him way too much credit. On the other hand, we have to balance it by saying, but there's a lot he does know, and he is a horrible, vicious enemy, and we need to be walking discerning with the Holy Spirit in us. Right. Well, what a fascinating uh, conversation. We're talking with Pastor Carl Gallops, and um, you're listening to the John Baldwin Show here on Victory Radio. Tell us where uh, folks can find this wonderful book. Thank you. Yeah, you can find me, all about me, my ministry, the church. I pastor programs that I'm on, the media that I do, television, radio, all of my books, everything at one place, carlgallops.com. It's very easy, just my name, dot com, carlgallops.com. Right above the picture of me there, you'll see a banner, and it is 
a banner about this book, Gods of the Vital Kingdom. I've got a, another one coming out, my tenth book will be coming out in the first quarter of uh, 2020, and uh, it'll tie into all of this as well. But you click on that, not only can you see this book, and you, not only can you read inside four or five chapters and see the whole table of contents, but you can see the endorsements, you can see the back cover, banter, the front cover. Uh, plus, if you scroll on down, you can see other books I've written. And you can go to those web pages and read inside of them. You can order them all right there. You can order them directly from me. They'll come autographed. They're published by Defender Publisher, a major Christian publisher in the United States. Uh, or you can get them anywhere good books are sold, uh, Christian bookstores and secular bookstores. You can get them on Amazon, Books and Billings, and Barnes and Noble. You can get them in mom and pop shops and everywhere else. And, and if they don't have them in stock, and most of them do, but if they don't, you can order them. But you can just start at carlgallops.com. Or you can go to amazon.com. I've got an author page there. If you're an okay. Amazon shopper, you can get them there. Yep. Uh, you mentioned, we talked a little minute ago about the Judas, uh, Satan entering Judas. And I tell you, I was reading the book, and this thought never occurred to me before. It sent chill bumps all up my body. When Jesus was addressing Judas and said, do what you're about to do quickly, who was he talking to at that moment? Yeah, yeah. Well, Jesus can speak and operate in multiple realms. <laughs> yeah. So he was looking at the face of Judas. But just like when he told Peter at Caesarea Philippi, when he said, get behind me, Satan. But he's looking right at Peter. And, you know, so so Jesus was looking at the physical realm of Judas, but he was also looking through the multidimensional realm of Satan standing right behind him with his hand on Judas' shoulder, if you will. Well, and I don't exactly know how all of that works, how Satan controls a human being, you know. But, but we know the demonic do that. And we see that clearly in the New Testament, uh, entering into the demoniac in the in the in, in the to- among the tombs and you know supernatural strength and 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 you know and, and, and you know, all through the New Testament we we discover that this is quite the capability of the demonic realm. So I think it was multiple when he looked at Judas and said, um, you know, do what you're going to do, do it quickly. Uh, he was looking at Judas, speaking to him about you know going forward with the with the. Uh, with the betrayal, I think he was uh, speaking to say, you know, get on with it. Now, now that you've have figured out who I am, get on with it. And see, Jesus came for the purpose of going to the cross. In his whole three years of public ministry, he was kind of disguising exactly who he was. That's why was often when he would heal people, like, you know, the lepers, and he would say, now go with, you know, or, you know, he would say, don't, don't tell anybody about this. Well, they usually would, but, and he knew they would. But um, but there was always this cloak, this veil of of a disguise. You know, God in the flesh is here, but he was headed to the cross. And if Satan had ever figured out, I got to keep him away from that cross because that's going to be my that's going to be my destruction. But not only did Satan not figure it out, but he entered into Judas for the specific purpose of finding one that would betray Jesus and get him on the cross. And I'm telling you, I, I explore this possibility. Now, now, whenever I go into my own speculation, as you saw in the book, I say, you know, look, I'm just speculating here. Mm-hmm. But when you put all the pieces, parts together, this is something to think about. I am convinced, and I could be wrong, but I'm convinced that based upon what Satan did know, added to what he didn't know, added to what he thought he was doing by delivering Jesus to the cross, once he had finally focused in after three years and said, okay, this has got to be that seed that came forth from the woman. Well, look what he's doing. Look, he's turning the cosmic world upside down. Obviously, he came from heaven. Obviously, he is a son, little s, of God. And that term, son of God, is, is, is B'nai Elohim, which means the angelic realm. Obviously, he's at least an angel. He's something. But then once he figures out, what if God himself has put on human? And he was foolish enough, this is Satan's words, foolish enough to come into my realm that I own, that I'm the God of. Now I've got him. Mm -hmm. And if I can kill him, then I can do what I said in Isaiah 14. I will finally ascend to the throne of God. Mm -hmm. I will be the ruler of all the gods, little g. I think that's what Satan was up to. I think that's why he killed him. Mm -hmm. I think he thought, I can kill God. See, Satan is so arrogant, he, he so desperately wants to be the god of this planet, this, this, you know, this cosmos. And I think that he finally figured out that God himself was in this man, the God-man, Jesus mm-hmm. Christ. So if I can get him on the ground, I mean, I think that's what he had to have thought. Because as, as Paul says in Second in First Corinthians, if, they, if he'd only known what he was doing, he would not have crucified. 
I think his arrogance was, and his pride was his downfall. God used Satan's pride against him, and that's what I think. Well, in the time we got left, I want to talk a little bit about, you, you go into one of my favorite subjects in the book, which is quantum physics. And I'll tell you what, we live in such an exciting age where we can see all these things, you know, through the microscope or whatever and, and understand it. How does the quantum world affect our material world? Yeah. Well, you know, there's a lot we know about that. There's a lot that we, we can use to answer that question. And then there's a lot we don't know, which is why we're still studying it so so fervently and frantically. It's why CERN Hadron Collider was, was built um, and, and why China wants one because we're, 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 we're broaching some barriers and boundaries that we've, we've, never, we've never understood before, at least in all of humanity up to about the last hundred years and the last several decades. But, but here's a powerful way. We do know, and, and for your listeners that may not know exactly what we're talking about, about quantum physics, let me, let me explain it very quickly. Atoms we know about, atoms create molecules, for example, H2O. What, you know, that's water. Well, what is that? Well, there's two atoms of hydrogen and one atom of oxygen, and they are joined together through this uh, molecular atomic fusion process. And when two atoms of hydrogen join one atom of oxygen, it creates matter. In this case, it happens to be a liquid called water, H2O. Okay, so, but at the atomic level, you know, that's where nuclear weaponry come, came from. We learned how to split those atoms. <laughs> and inside of those atoms, which are unseeable by the human eye, is, is a force, an energy, a power that is devastating if it's handled, mishandled. That became very fascinating to us. Well, then as we began to study, we understood that the atom, which, which for the longest, I mean, for, for, oh, for a couple thousand years, you know, philosophers and scientists of their day uh, theorized the atom, and they understood that it was the smallest of, as, as you could go. In fact, that's what the word atom comes from. I think it comes from a Latin word, I think. I can't remember if it's Greek or Latin, but it, it basically means the smallest, the tiniest thing. But then, in the last hundred years, we discovered, of course, that, well, it's actually not. The atom is made up of pieces, parts, protons, neutrons, electrons, and, and that, they, they, that the protons and the electrons travel around the neutron, the center of it, almost like a solar system, if you would. And so, you know, there's movement, there's activity. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. So, but then they thought, okay, well, that's the smallest it gets. But then, <laughs> in the last, you know, 50, 60, 70 years, we have discovered that, oh no, that even those parts are made up of parts. And even among those pieces, parts, quantum, quantum is a Latin term that means um, how small does it go, it's the smallest part, or how, how tiny it gets. <laughs> right. Those are loose definitions of the word quantum. How tiny can it get physics, <laughs> you know? quantum physics. So then they discovered not only are there pieces parts to the pieces parts of the atom, which make up the molecules, which make up matter, but then they discovered that all come together by energy, basically photoelectric energy. Basically, that's light that's held by the power of light. Isn't it interesting? Jesus says he's the light of the world. Isn't it interesting that, that, that uh, um, uh, uh, Colossians says, by him, Jesus, all things were made, and nothing that was made, that mm -hmm. has been made, was made without him. And in him, all things fold together. And now we know, scientifically, that the atom holds the game of that power that we call uh, photons and photoelectronic uh, uh, by, by light. It's held together by light. And so now, I mean, we're just beginning to understand this, but the bottom line is, think of this, John, to answer your question. How does quantum physics affect our physical reality? It's a weird relationship. There are universal laws, you know, laws of the universe, thermodynamics, how things work, and how, you know, it's universal laws. But nothing that we see as matter could exist if it weren't for the quantum particles and their movements and the atomic structure of all matter. And when you think about it, brother, what makes the quantum physics uh, uh, study so complicated 
complicated right now is that with all that we do know, there's still so much we don't know. We can we cannot predict the predictability of where a specific quantum particle will be at any given moment. So far, has been impossible for us to predict. Why? Because there seems to be no rhyme or reason to the movement within those. It'll give you a headache trying to figure it out sometimes, but I, I find I it fascinating. The um, the um, yet, yet the evolutionists want us to believe that all of this happened by an accidental explosion and a chemical sludge bomb. Yeah, see, quantum physics to me completely disproves the theory of evolution because well, you know when they when they the studies they've done, you know, if, if an electron is being observed, it's a particle. If it's not, it's a wave. That just blows my mind. How does it know when it's being observed to, to collapse into a particle? Um, you know, Paul talked about that in, uh, I'm assuming Paul, in the Hebrews where it says um, everything, that, uh, and I'm paraphrasing here, but everything that we see were, were made by things which are not seen. Yes. And no, that, right. that's, a, that's a, a probably the best definition you can think of of, of the quantum world. Um, and then you get into quantum entanglement where an electron on one side of the universe, if it spins up, that he has to have a pair that spins down on the other side of the universe, which then makes the speed of light irrelevant. And this really scared Einstein. He didn't. He thought it was spooky science. <laughs> That's what he called it, and yeah. I quote that in my book. He called it spooky, the, the spooky science, because yeah, I mean, because we look at the speed of light. That's mm -hmm. a universal law, we think. Yet, when you get into the quantum world, you understand that even the speed of light can be. Um, can be eclipsed, and that's what scared Einstein and mm. and confused him. <laughs> and, and even again, that's why the Hadron Collider is built. They're still trying to unravel these mysteries. But one of the things they're so fascinated with is they understand at least the theory of multiple dimensions, and they're looking for the porters. Because you called you you spoke of the entanglement theory mm. of the entanglement problem, and, and that is so. So just to break it down for people that are um, new to all we're talking about. And for those who are like hold degrees in quantum physics, they probably think you and I are completely stupid. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because I mean, because I'm just speaking at a layman's term here, but in, in, in layman's terms, um, and uh, I've studied it at a much deeper level, but I don't like coming on interviews and speaking at a doctoral level. But, but with the tang entanglement theory, uh, it, 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 here's an illustration. So if you take an atom, and if you can take... And, and, and uh, 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 an electron from that atom, and as you said, if somehow we could encapsulate that and fly it to the other side of the universe, to, well, let's just say to the other side of our galaxy, and if you could stimulate that electron that's out in space, then the corresponding electron from the atom from which you took it, it responds in the very same manner <laughs> that... That, or, or appropriate manner that the one that you stimulated in space millions of miles away. Well, how can it be? How can they communicate like that? I mean, how can it be that there's instantaneous communication between two physical realities that are separated by millions of miles? And, and, I mean, you know, this just blows scientists away. By the way, to me, that explains prayer, John. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, we've been encoded, we've been embedded with a with a biological microchip, if you will, that the Holy Spirit energizes when he enters us, that connects us with the throne of God. And when we lift up our prayer, it's not just going into air, it's not just going up to the ceiling of the, of the building we're in. 
we're connecting, theoretically, you know, millions of miles away with the throne of God, instantly. Mm. How do we know that can happen? Science tells us. That they're already doing that with electrons and entanglement theory. So, I, I mean, the, more, the deeper we get into our scientific discoveries, the more the Bible comes alive, the more the Word of God and the, and the Declaration. There's, there's nothing like this in the Quran, for example. Mm. Nothing like it in the teachings of Buddha. Nothing like it in the Hindu Vedas. Nothing like it in the teachings of Nostradamus. No, nothing like it in the world. Only in the Word of God does it speak of entanglement theory, multiple universes, time travel, portals, uh, you know, everything being made that we see by things that are unseen, quantum theory, I mean, atomic theory. It's all right there in the Word of God. You won't find it anywhere else. Yeah. One of the last questions I have, I have a couple, just a couple more. When Jesus healed people, was he doing that at the quantum level? You know, there's different ways of, of, of saying that. I, mm-hmm. I would say yes for, for our physical minds to understand this. Mm-hmm. Here's the deal. Jesus doesn't operate... How do I say this? God does not operate at the quantum level. He created the okay. quantum particles. Uh, Jesus, God doesn't operate in the universe. He created the universe, and maybe multiple universes. See, I use this illustration like a computer. I'm sitting at a computer. In fact, I've got one in front of me right now in my office. If I punch several keys on my computer, I can create a graphic image. I can call up an imaging program. I can draw on it and save it. Boom, there's an image. Right. So I've, I've punched a bunch of keys, and I've created an image. There it is. Well, now, how did that work? Is there a little man running around inside of my computer that arranges and adjusts everything? No, 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 no. The God of the computer, little g, the, 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 the creator of the computer doesn't live inside the computer. He lives outside of it. Yet he has programmed it such that when the various elements inside the computer are manipulated, then there are equations and algorithms that make things appear, that make things work. Well, that's how our universe is. God is the creator. He's, we're inside the, the biological computer, if you will. Uh, I, I'm not getting into matrix now or anything. I'm talking about we're, we are mathematically made. But DNA proves that. The more we understand about DNA, the more we understand about quantum mechanics, the more we understand that evolution science is a bunch of junk. The more the, and, and so when the, the Bible tells us that God created the universe and everything in it, created the universe. That means he existed outside of the universe. He existed before the universe. Oh, absolutely. So, so when Jesus heals, he is when he speaks to the wind and the waves and says, peace, be still. Well, he's the word. Everything, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. And the word became flesh. So he's the word. All he has to do is speak it. In Genesis chapter 1, and then God said, what, look at the first thing God creates, by the way. Let there be light. Now we know from quantum mechanics, everything in the world holds together. Every atom holds together by light. If we didn't have light first, we couldn't have atoms. If we couldn't have atoms, we couldn't have molecules. If we couldn't have molecules, we couldn't have matter. If we didn't have matter, we could not have this physical world we live in. First, there had to be light. And how did Moses know that? Well, if God told him. Jesus heals, yes. From the earthly point of view, he's calling upon all of these powers. But it's richer than that. He's not just calling upon them. He created them. Mm-hmm. He's commanding them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, like if, I'll, I'll forget, like if a person's, uh, like the lady that had the problem with the bleeding, that, that reached his garment, and he touched her, or she touched him, and was healed. I, I, even Jesus didn't even have to say anything at that point the power just went out from him to I, I think what he did was that whatever at the cellular level um the power went out to to heal those cells and thus yeah. healing the woman i could yeah i can give you another one just as startling the man with the withered hand in the in the synagogue mm. jesus said stretch out your hand he didn't touch it he just ordered it stretch your hand out yeah and when he did the withered hand i've done a lot of studying on that that means it was just shriveled up into a bony mass of sinew like a claw that had folded in on itself. It was useless. It was probably smaller than the other. It was mangled. It was it was grotesque. Yet at Jesus' words, the man reached out his hand, and it was completely like the other hand. At Jesus' words, 
word, he created a new hand in front of everybody. Just like the loaves of bread and the two fish. Yeah. And Jesus' word, he creates something out of nothing. How can this be, John? Well, well people say, well, he's using quantum mechanics. Well, no, it, he's not using it like, oh my gosh, if this Adam doesn't do what it's supposed <laughs> to do, I'm going to look like an idiot in front of people. No, he's commanding the quantum particles right. to right. rearrange themselves because he is the word. He's the one that says, let there be light, and there was. Let there be a hand, and there is. Let the bleeding stop, and it does. Let the leprosy go away, and it does. Let this eyeball see, and the blind man sees. Let this dead man come out of the grave. Lazarus, come forth. I'm speaking it, and he does. That's what's happening, John. He is the, he is the commander and the creator of the quantum world. And one of my favorite, and we'll end with this because I want to end on an upbeat note here. The the first Corinthians 15 is one of my favorite uh, chapters in the Bible because it describes what's going to happen. Jesus is going to command the quantum world and we're going to have resurrected bodies and that are immortal. That's just exciting. Yeah, no, it is. And I, and I want to just say to people, you know, sometimes people read that and say, oh, that means we sleep in the graves because we're, no, 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 no. If you read the whole scripture, put it all together, what he's a resurrected body means the fish coming out of the fish tank and being transformed. It means, it means when, see, look, if when Jesus was put in the tomb from the cross, okay, we say, well, he died and he was put in the tomb. Okay, yes, but what does that mean? Did he just lay there? It was his body starting to rot? Was he just laying in there unconscious? No. What did he tell the thief on the cross? Hey, today you'll be with me in paradise. Oh, so he was alive. Yeah. But I thought he died. Well, he did. See, the word death just means in the physical realm, right. the essence of who we are, our life, it leaves the vehicle that we were loaned for these 70, 80, 90 years. We leave it. But we are still alive. The thief, he told the thief, today you will be with me. You're the fish in the fish tank. Mm -hmm. But at my word, you will be transformed and you're going to enter my Father's realm with me. So, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul's trying to explain the same thing. He says, look, there are many different kinds of flesh. Fish have one kind of flesh. The birds have another kind of flesh. We have another kind of flesh. And we're all flesh and blood. That's what Paul's trying to say. He said, but then, when we get our resurrected bodies, that, that's like Jesus. So Jesus left, went to paradise. But then, through the, through the portals that he commands, he came back three days later, he is walking around. He's out of the grave. Well, he didn't have to bust out of the grave. He didn't have to open the door. He didn't have to call down angels and say, hey, open this, roll back this stone so I can get out of here. No, he, he, just, he just was. He entered a portal and boom, he was there. The door was opened by angels only to show the world that he, his, Jesus himself was not there. His whole body was gone, showing them that he is the creator and the Lord of all. So, yes, when... Uh, 1 Corinthians, what Paul is talking about, when Jesus comes back to rule and reign, all of those, like the thief on the cross, who were in paradise, will come back in resurrected bodies, just like Jesus. In other words, now they're coming back into this dimension to rule and reign. So they will have bodies fit for this world again, but they will be glorified bodies, like Jesus was. Jesus' body was glorified. He could walk through walls, apparently. I mean, you know, he just showed up among the disciples in a locked room. Yet he sat down on the beach and ate fish with them. He was in a real body, but it was glorified. Right. So that's what Paul's talking about, and it has nothing to do with soul sleep and all that stuff. No, 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 no. It's talking about, from the earthly point of view, that it, it will appear as though, look at all these people, they've come back from the dead. Well, they never were really, quote, I'm making air quotes now. They were just gone from the fish tank. Does that make sense, John? Yeah, I hadn't thought about it from that perspective before. That's an excellent analogy. Well, thank you so much for your time, uh, Carl Gallops. And we, we, uh, I'll have to have you on again with your new book comes out here, you said in a uh, couple months. Yeah, I think it releases in March. Okay. In the first quarter, and I think it's sometime in early March. Well, thank you so much for your time. This is just a fascinating subject. I had a uh, hundred other questions I could ask you, but it's like, well, thank <laughs> there's you. so much I'm stuff. I'm not inviting myself back, but if you want to talk about this stuff and keep going further, just feel free to call me. But in the meantime, I'm honored to be able to be here today. Yeah, thank you so much. 
And that'll wrap up another edition of the John Baldwin Show here on Victory Radio. Thank you so much for listening.